Hi everybody, it's me, Jamie Tomey from Artist Bookhouse. I am so excited about today's Artist Bookhouse conversation because I get to hang out with my friend Brandon Graham, who I've known for forever. So please, please enjoy it. I'm doing really good. I'm doing good. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Thank you for being here. So you're coming at us through the screen in Kansas City. Um, so usually when we start these conversations, I start with the question, how did you come to the book arts? But what I would rather do with you is talk about um, where you started as an artist and how the idea of story led you to where you are today. Because you have now three novels that are published, um, a lot of people might consider you more of a novelist than an artist. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of, I want to talk about how the idea of story fed into your art and how you became an artist. And there's a lot of stuff there. I, I used to spend lots and lots of time sitting at a potter's wheel, um, center and clay. Um, and I think I was attracted to ceramics as a process because um, it was very meditative. I couldn't fake it. The clay wouldn't allow me to lie. Either I made something well or I didn't. Uh, and if I didn't, it would blow up. And uh, it was hard to uh, argue with a pot that had a big crack through the bottom of it. It was just not well done. It was good for me to just do something real, something tangible. You, my family is full of preachers and blue collar workers really. And so going into the arts was a little bit of a odd choice. And so doing something that had a lot of handcraft and a lot of process felt more honest to me. You know, when you're sitting at a wheel and you're making a decision about what you're going to throw and you've got the clay center, there's kind of, there's a lot of ways to think about the design that you're going to do. But one of the things you can think about is um, the silhouette of the form as a series of convex and concave lines that have a certain rhythm. And, you know, there's some rules like the lip and the foot relate to one another. Uh, there's a certain rhythm to the uh, finger ridges that you're leaving when you're forming the piece and the shapes that you're making. And so you start making decisions about what you think is beautiful and what you think isn't and what works for you and what you like. But there's another completely different way to think about it. What is it for? What's the vessel going to be for? And then what space do I need to open up in the clay that is best for the function of the piece. And so instead of thinking about what the exterior of it would look like, all I did was say, what, it, what am I making? I'm making a water pitcher. Well, what shape uh, does it need to be and how much water do I want it to hold? Well, I want it to hold a gallon, so it needs to be a certain size. And then water pours out of a vessel in certain ways based on the shape. And so how do you make the perfect shape for pouring water? Okay, at the same time, that I was sort of turning the way I was thinking about ceramics around. I was also a lit major. And one thing I read was Donald Barthelme. He's kind of considered the father of flash fiction, kind of made deconstructed fiction. And he's got this famous short story called Chablis. I'm gonna probably butcher it a little bit. I know I will, but basically it has four declarative sentences at the beginning of it. It's the first paragraph and it says something like, uh, my wife thinks we need a dog. We don't have a lot of money. She says the dog's for the baby. The car needs new radial tires. And, <laughs> and so I, I thought this was very interesting um, because what Barthel May did was he tried to figure out the least that he could put on the page and have it do the thing that he wanted. So in the first paragraph, he managed to introduce three characters, some kind of dynamic, um, 
and a major tension that I didn't really understand because the leap, the space between the third sentence, right? You've got three sentences that sort of make sense, one after the other. And then the fourth one has this big logical leap. And, and so it, that like thinking of making a space inside a physical lump of clay and then thinking about the logical space between the sentence structure in Bartholomew it seemed like it belonged together, right? And, yeah. it, and I started trying to make logic of <laughs> two different things that in some ways felt the same, but I couldn't explain why they were the same in my head. Yeah, as far as making the connection between the throwing of the thing and the reading slash writing of the thing, were you at that time when you were like 19, 20, 22, thinking in terms of creative process or had that not occurred to you that these were parallel processes? When I started making work, I think I really made it for myself. I wasn't that interested in audience. I wanted to make beautiful things and be involved in a process that sort of centered me personally. As time went on, I became more invested in how I say something specific to an audience. And I started caring less about process for me and more about the end, where it ended up, who was going to receive it and how they received it. And so there was a shift over time to caring more about how the audience takes it, but also having more to say because I had more life experience. You were doing pottery and you were also doing um, creative writing. So how did you start to translate character and plot and arc yeah. of a story into those ceramic pieces. So when I started, I thought they were two completely different fields that just felt good together. I just was interested in both. There were examples in the world and of people that I knew that were doing, that were combining visual work with written work. For instance, a poet, Bob Jones, and a watercolorist, Rich Lerman. One would write and the other would respond visually. And then they would make little books. There was someone who had a little letterpress uh, in the department, uh, Professor Olpen, and he would print things up. And I liked this idea of, oh, there's a visual narrative and there's a written narrative and the two things don't tell the same story, but they play off of each other. And then it's in the form of a book and that's lovely. I was doing a lot of figure drawing as one does uh, when you're in art school. And I started thinking of the figures as characters. And I also started thinking about how do you translate an image that's a detailed drawing onto a ceramic surface in a way that makes sense for the process. And so I started making stencils of the drawings I liked and putting them on ceramics. And then I started thinking about how each vessel next to each other looked like a figure group. And I started sort of telling stories about, oh, here's a group of figures that are friends, they're positioned next to each other. And then here's another figure that's isolated on a different vessel. And that was where it started, was a kind of um, really abstract kind of uh, in-group, out-group commentary, kind of, I would call abstract social commentary that I started yeah. with. Yeah, and it also has that space for the viewer slash reader of the narratives one by or the, the pieces one by one to then fill in the story yeah. at that time. And I think that I, I was focused a lot actually on body language. So uh, oh. I would often make figure, I would do figures that had their backs turned to one another um, and or had their heads bowed in a certain way. And I was really interested in that and what that meant when you put them juxtaposed in just the right way. It yeah. had a certain kind of tension that I liked. So I think that's where I started playing with it. And so you got your double major in um, literature and art, and then you switched uh, very quickly, I remember, straight into grad school. Why, yeah. why did you start that master's? What was the impetus for going straight in? <clears throat> Part of it was a little bit practical, I think. After I realized that poetry and pottery was not necessarily going to pay any bills. I decided to stick with 
academia and I got a full ride, you know, teaching fellowship. And so I immediately started teaching drawing and design classes and, and then, yeah, then did my grad work. Yeah. You distilled it a little bit more, you filtered it a little bit more and got more refined on I those did. narrative pieces. And that's when you first made paper too, if I recall correctly. That's right. That's right. We made paper together for the first time. We in, did in the, for your the, first time. <laughs> okay. In the yeah. print studio. Yeah. And so you came in one time and started to make paper and then translated your figures onto those handmade pieces of paper. Um, what made you decide to learn paper as a thing coming from ceramics? Well, part of it was love of process, right? So anything that had more process than was necessary, that's really what I wanted. And so, so paper was just like another thing. It felt like ceramics. There were lots of steps. I was always wet and cold. And I thought that the, the, the colors related. So natural right. fibers and like natural clay look like they belong together. And so yeah. I started trying to um, use like the slab roller in the, in the ceramic studio, sort of like a press and use natural clay colorants to press into the paper. Um, mm -hmm. Like you said, process oriented, but beautiful in a way that you can't really, because you are basically printing with clay, yeah, um, staining, essentially. Um, and so it's really, really cool process. How did you <laughs> go from that work to then making books and, and wanting to explore that? Mm. So I wrote pretty regularly, just as one of the things I did. Uh, a lot of times I wrote notes for stories in the form of a poem. Mm -hmm. And that way I had like a little piece of language that I could use to build off of. So uh, I was running for a brief time, a ceramics program um, at a community college and um, mostly teaching there at night because we had two small children by then. And um, I realized that my work was starting to look like demos for the classes. And okay. I felt kind of like uh, my own creative process slipping away from me. I was really good at teaching other people how to make simple things, but then I didn't have any time to take those simple things I was demoing and do anything more with them. And I started thinking about, you know, I, I really would like to get an MFA and what would I like it to be in? So when I was in Lincoln, Nebraska, I was a gallery director for about two years. And um, while I was there, I would bop around the Haymarket and see, you know, like first Friday exhibitions. And that's the first time I saw a book arts exhibition. Someone oh. had taken a bunch of maps and had done relief uh, cuts of animals and printed them on the maps. And I remember thinking, oh, this is great. I love relief cuts. I love maps. And it's in the form of a book. And what could be better? And then I thought, oh, you know, it would be really great if I take a closer look and like the kangaroo is printed on Australia. Then I'm going to think, oh, then they've really done something. And then I looked at it and they hadn't done that. And then I was like, I could do better than this. And so <laughs> I think that, that's where I first started thinking about you know, a visual book as something expressive, other than like graphic novels or comic strips or something like that, thinking of it in a different way, it, or, or zines too, you know. There was a, a hint of jealousy there, like, oh, this is cool, I could do that. And then it moved to a place of, I could really do that and I could do it a lot better. <clears throat> yeah, I hate to make it competitive like that because I don't think that <laughs> it needs to be. But the truth is, is that often when I, see something that inspires me, I'm interested in how it was done. Like I right. want to know how they did it. And then in the process of understanding what they were doing and why, I thought, oh, I could, if I had done this, I could have done it in a way that I would have liked more. Exactly. <laughs> and that, exactly. And that's the first, that's the first step, I think, for me to go like, like that starts the ball rolling for me to actually do something. Right. And so then this was in the 2000s, like 2000, I don't even remember, 2007, 2008, something like that. I got this email from Brandon saying, hey, I saw your name on the uh, Chicago, Columbia College Chicago books 
book and paper center website what's up with that and then you came up for a visit and had a tour and decided to apply and then got your mfa in book and paper while you were in grad school you were also the primary caregiver to your children right yeah and then also since then or i guess like their whole lives you've been their primary caregiver how do you balance fatherhood with being an artist and being a writer since you're a novelist? So um, maybe the best answer is that I have no balance in my life whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a constant fight. There's always something new that has to be taken care of and you yeah. always have to readjust. You always set aside time to get something done and then that time gets eaten up. Um, but, you know, when I was in the MFA program, was the first time I started saying to myself, um, I'm a parent and I care more and more about the shape of the world. It's part of the reason that I leaned into books and writing is because I feel like I could be more specific about social issues. Um, but also I started embracing the fact that I was a father. I started writing things and making small artist books that were about that. A lot of them, I had this, in a short book, I think that a <clears throat> unreliable narrator voice works really well, especially as a straight white guy. One thing that I can do is I can say horrible things that I've heard other straight white guys say and have it be a kind of commentary on that attitude. Um, yeah. And so I did a whole, a whole series of things about um, sort of like bad parenting advice where, I, you know, the kind of things that my dad would have thought made sense. And those were in the form of artist books. And we, I believe you sent me some images of those so we can drop those images in yeah, to the I conversation mean, as well. The, Do you have people responding to those in negative ways, thinking that you're saying those things and that you truly believe them? Or do they get the satire? Well, so I think if I do it right, then they feel like they're in on the joke. Okay. But, uh, but people bring their own stuff to the table. And sure. w once in a while, people aren't sure. So uh, I wrote a story. Uh, there's, a, there's a photo that I sent of um, an installation at the C23 gallery, which, yeah, that was on uh, Congress and Wabash. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've got a couple exterior shots of an installation there. Well, it had text in vinyl on the windows and it was a first person story. Um, and when it was critiqued, the professor said, um, oh, you're still in touch with person in this story. And I was like, you know, I know it's first person, but it's just fiction. I, you know, I made that person up. And then the critique went like this. It went, well, so is lying really an important part of your work? <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and I actually thought seriously about the question. And I actually really do like the idea of writing things that are close enough to actually biographical mm -hmm. that people who know me will um, know where the truth lies. But people who don't really know me, they won't know. I like that kind of tension. I actually think that if I'm writing something that makes me a little uncomfortable, then I probably, uh, they don't probably affect other people. And okay. so often I dance around things that make me slightly queasy to put on the page. <laughs> yeah. And then you really go for it. And then you have this character who isn't you, but makes you uncomfortable. But that's a good thing because you're telling a certain kind of story. Right. Yeah. So yeah. are you writing more now than you're making visual art? Are you making still small books? Are you, what's, what's your focus right now? I have a letterpress set up that I'm not really using much yet, but I'm, I've made a space and got tables set up and I want to do small books. Mm -hmm. um, I'm mostly writing. Um, but the truth is, is that visual work has kind of taken a funny arc for me in that I started out doing it just for me because the process was healthy for me. And um, as time has gone on, you know, I wanted to be more and more, more pointed with the kinds of things I could do visually. And now that writing is doing that job, 
I've started making work just that I want. And particularly, I like collaborating with people mm -hmm. I like and just having it be a good, healthy experience in making things. Um, and so that's sort of where I am. I've got a bunch of little projects um, that have short pieces of text as the beginning of them, uh, but I've got a bunch of visual sketches and notes. And so I'm gonna construct little bookish things and um, see how that goes too, so. And then you're still writing because you're working on your fourth novel right now? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm about 210 pages in right now. First so. draft, yeah. Yeah, I really wanted to be done by August 10th, which is when the third one comes out, but... Um, Speaking of your novels, you have three novels that have been published. You have Good for Nothing, and you have, I, I'm trying not to put them in order of my favorite versus my, but your second novel is Missing People, which is one of my favorite books. And then your third novel is Half Dead, which is one of my favorite books. I, you know, having read, having read them multiple times in manuscript form and then in pre-pub form and then publication form, I can trace the arc through the stories and I can see how you how you had that process happen. Do you feel like for you as a writer, it's important for your audience to kind of see that linear process through the three novels? One way that it, so when I wrote Good for Nothing, I sort of had to play a mental game to trip myself into writing a novel. I had to say, <laughs> I'm just gonna write a short story. And then I had to say, oh, I've got a lot of pages. Maybe it'll be a novella. And then I said, okay, it's like 250 pages. Let's be honest, I'm writing a novel. Because one of my favorite books is um, Light in August by Faulkner. Okay. Faulkner. And um, I love that book. I read it at a time that it was like the perfect thing for me to read. And it was really powerful. And so if I told myself I was writing a novel, I felt like I was saying, you're trying to be Faulkner. And that <laughs> seemed like I just couldn't function that way. Right. And so if I lied and then could just get it done, um, then I wouldn't be in competition with a certain novel that I held really dear. And I think the same principle has applied to ongoing novels in that I really don't think of it as writing individual books. I think of it as creating a body of work. And right. so um, it takes a little pressure off the individual novel um, and I also think that they inform one another in kind of an interesting way. Yeah, I think that it also maybe takes pressure off as you're working on each one. Like, I'm only writing a little bit of this long thing. Like, I'm just going to say this scene right here or this moment right here with these characters. It's, it's Anne Lamott. Yes. It's right, bird by bird. Bird by bird. Totally bird by bird. Um, one thing that's also interesting, just the visuals in the novel and those moments that are so small in a person's life, in your characters' lives, but they just sort of create that world. You have created a very specific Chicago in your work. And can you talk a little bit about how working on visual things translates into working on written things, translates into working on visual things for you. Do you have a balance between those two things and how do they inform one another? I think my language choices are informed by my visual arts background, but I also think that my observation skills have been honed as a visual artist. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that I look at the world like a visual artist um, and then I use visual language that I know from art history and apply that to literary situations. The visual language translating into written language. That makes sense. I think people are <laughs> curious about where characters come from when you're talking about a novel. Like yeah. where do these people come from and where they live in you as a person? Do you feel like your characters are different pieces of you? Hmm. So I think that if you look at Missing People, I feel like that novel, the four primary characters um, are all slices of me at different okay. times, right? I think it's pretty easy to spot that. There's like two adult parental versions of me and two young 
one is idealistic and one is angry, but right. right you could you could figure that out pretty easily if you knew me in those stages of my life. But I think that half dead isn't that way. Um, missing people's the the whole premise was again from drawing it was um, well you can you can make a composition that focuses on the on the foreground, but you can also make a composition that focuses on the negative space. And so I was interested in how do you write a novel about a character that isn't there? And so that's how Missing People came about. Uh, the four main characters are sort of how you know the missing person. Um, and they all have different opinions of that person. And so you get a kind of complex, fractured jumble that adds up to what seems like a pretty well-rounded character, I think, in Edda. So um, with Half Dead, um, you know, it started with a premise. It was um, if someone thinks that they don't have anything to risk, um, but they do something that the outside world thinks of as brave, then are they heroic or are they not heroic? And that's really where the concept for the main character came from. It's why he thinks he's dead. And that way, when he does something, that may be, you know, putting his life on the line. The question is, you know, is he, did he do something good or not? Was it a good thing? Is he a good person? That kind of thing. And how did you come up with the other characters in the story? Because you have multiple points of view that alternate in the chapters. How did, where did those people come up, come from? Well, part of it is just my experience living in a big city like Chicago is that all things happen at once to all people all the time. And so I think <laughs> that I wanted a lot of people with a lot of different backgrounds and a lot of different ages that were crossing paths. And I wanted people of different opinions. I wanted people of different socioeconomic uh, backgrounds. I wanted, yeah. yeah. So, so I, I had been teaching at Dominican University and Dominican, probably 80% of the, my students were first generation Mexican-American. The first assignment that I gave them, I was teaching comp classes and the first assignment was a personal essay. And so everyone wrote stories about their lives. And, you know, I probably had, let's say I had 120 students while I taught there. And so I read 120 personal stories about what it was like for them to be in Kansas City, a member of their family and the kinds of pressures they had, and then had all kinds of private conversations, you know, one-on-one -on -one conversations related to the essay, but also it's about their life. So about their life. And there's this kind of thing that happens when you're teaching 19 year olds that, you know, you are interested in them and they, they think maybe you could be a good guide on other issues unrelated to class. And so I got to know a lot of people pretty well. And I think that Mo and Whistler both are characters that sort of came out of that experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I am so excited to see what you come up with next. Thank you, I appreciate that. You've probably read more closely and more versions of my work than anybody. So <laughs> I really am glad you like it. Yeah. <laughs> I think here, okay, your target audience is weird, crimey, mystery, thrillery book person. Yeah. <laughs> right here. <laughs> so thank you for joining us today, Brandon. It was such a joy to have you in our conversation and I appreciate it. And thank you everyone for watching. If you would like to sponsor more of our work, if you want to see more of our work, um, everything right now is still virtual, so please head on over to our website at artistbookhouse.org. Artists is plural, and slash donate, you can, um, or actually it's slash support now, and you can donate or you can sign up to volunteer if you're in the Chicagoland area to help us. We have to raise a whole lot of money to renovate the Harley Clark Mansion to be our, our actual home. So thank you, thank you everyone.